Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Partners in Transportation. And welcome to our webinar, Partners in Transportation Workforce Solutions, Community Colleges and Employers. My name is Carol Vallette, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. I work here at the Northeast Transportation Workforce Center, and I'm really happy to be with everybody today. Um, we've pulled together really a great presentation with people representing all of these organizations. Our emphasis, of course, is on how educational programs at community colleges thrive and succeed with employer and business partners. Um, just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be available later for viewing on our website at netwc.net. But first, before we get into our presentations, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. One is that if you have a question at any time during the presentation, please just ask your question in the question box. We'll address questions when we're able to. All the questions are noted in the GoToWebinar platform, and if we're unable to answer them during this session, we'll post the questions and the answers on the NETWC website. Also, use the question box if you have a technical issue, you know, if you can't hear us or you don't know how to do something, uh, hopefully you'll be able to ask that question. Um, we'll do our best to try and resolve any problems. And there'll be a little transition time as we switch presentations, so please bear with us, but we're also going to hope to pull, uh, pose some other polling questions uh, during that time. And lastly, there's a very short seven-question survey that will pop up when you close out of the webinar, and it would be a great help to us, the organizers, if you could take just a very few minutes to answer the survey. It'll give us input on this uh, webinar, but more importantly, help us to develop other um, seminars from the future that will be of interest and use to all of you. So before we get to our speakers, I want to give a little bit of a brief overview of the Northeast Transportation Work Workforce Center. So the NETWC is a Federal Highway Administration funded initiative that started in late 2014. Through a competitive process, the Transportation Research Center at the University of Vermont was awarded funding in partnership with Rutgers University to establish the center, and we cover the 11 sites in the Northeast and the District of Columbia. So we've incorporated that into our logo here. You see we go from Maine down to Maryland. Uh, the center is part of a national network with uh, four other regional centers, and you can see them on this colored map in the universities that uh, are responsible for them. And each center is intended to be a one-stop shop to help define the transportation workforce needs in their region and connect um, educators employer, with employers. And today we focus on two important partners, and that's community colleges and related employers. We at the um, Transportation Research Center at the University of Vermont did some previous work with community colleges, including survey work, and we really realized the breadth and level of activity incurring, occurring in transportation at community colleges. And we know that creating resources for others to use and share is, is so important. Um, part of what we do at the NETWC through our website is connect educators, employers, and also, we can't forget the job seekers, because that's really the workforce of the future for transportation. But now I'd like to move on and introduce the speakers you'll be hearing from today. So first up, we'll have um, both Esther Gandica of Atlantic Cape Community College and Anthony Pizzullo from South Jersey Gas. They'll be talking about their gas operator technician program they developed together. After that, we'll hear from Kip Snow. Kip is... Um, with Anne Arundel Community College, and he'll be speaking about how they really have a very, very successful transportation, logistics, and cargo security program, and this success is all due to their industry partnerships. And then we'll turn to Anne Harrison. Anne is the um, communications manager and works with the Workforce Alliance of Connecticut, and she's also including material in her presentation from Kimberly Dunham. Kimberly is the executive director of the Greater New Haven Transit District, but unfortunately was unable to be with us today. And Anne's presentation will focus on transportation workforce dynamics. You know, what are those key elements from employers and educators that lead to success for participants and the transportation workforce? So at this point, I'd like to uh, launch a poll to give us just a little more idea of who we have with us today. 
our first poll looked at the organizations represented, if I remember correctly, we had a um, uh, high number of educators and also some employers. And this poll asked what region of the country you're from. And obviously this uh, webinar is organized by the Northeast, but um, we know we have people from other parts and other regions. And certainly everything we do is open to people from throughout the, throughout the U.S. So if you can take a minute to answer this poll, that would be great. We'll be moving on to our first presentation, which will be um, Esther Gandica and Tony Pizzullo. So while you're answering the poll, and I know Esther is getting ready to share her screen, let me just um, give you a little background on both of them. So Esther is the Interim Senior Director at Atlantic Cape Community College Continuing Education Department. She's a very experienced educator with a strong financial, management, and accounting background. She has over 25 years' experience in designing, developing, and monitoring training initiatives in both the private and public sectors, as well as many years in the classroom. Um, and Esther holds a master's degree in instructional technology. So let's, and Tony Pizzullo is the director of work and process management at South Jersey Gas Company, where he was previously the director of human resources. Tony has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering as well as an MBA. So let's take a second and look at our poll results, mainly the Northeast, a little from the Southeast, and also from the West. So that is fantastic. So we can probably move our poll results now and share uh, Esther's screen and move into a presentation from both Esther and Tony. Thank you, Carol. This is Tony Pizzullo, and I'd also like to thank Glenn and, and you the North, and the rest of the Northeast Transportation Workforce Center for providing Esther and I this opportunity to share our story with you. Uh, Esther and I hope that you'll benefit from the presentation and find ways to try something similar at your location. Again, we are Tony Pizzullo from South Jersey Gas and Esther Gandisi from the Atlantic Cape Community College. Normally in the natural gas uh, industry, we like to start most of our meetings with a safety minute. Uh, we'll make somewhat of an exception today, but not, not really, because the program that we'll be talking to you about today is really all about building a safer and smarter workforce. When we look at and perform root cause analyses of pipeline incidences, we tend to find that having a better trained workforce reduces the risk and lessens the likelihood of problems. And so what we've tried to do is to create that, uh, that learning environment where people will, will actually understand the big picture and uh, about the work that they're performing before they start to perform the work, before they find themselves in an excavation and in a dangerous environment. Uh, we want to give them the tools that they need to be successful, and that's what this program is all about. So you see on the slide uh, an introduction to South Jersey Gas Company. We essentially serve the seven southern counties of New Jersey. Uh, don't hold this against us. We're basic. <laughs> we're mostly Eagles, Phillies, and Flyer fans. But uh, with that said, uh, we serve Cape May and Atlantic counties, and we hope you'll find a way to. Uh, vacation with us and perhaps even have some of your business meetings here uh, in Atlantic City and, and, and south to Cape May. The overall program objective is, was, uh, was to create a pipeline of qualified individuals that uh, South Jersey Gas Company and our contractors could hire from. South Jersey Gas Company is in the middle of a very large pipeline infrastructure replacement program and we outsource a significant amount of our work. Uh, it's approximately $100 million worth of work per year as, a, as an estimate. And that creates a lot of jobs in, the, uh, in, in our territory in New Jersey. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that the individuals that perform the work are very well qualified. I think the objective here is consistent to the uh, Northeast Transportation Workforce Center's strategy overall. And what we're about is trying to teach life skills. For some levity, you know, what they say about, you know, trying to teach someone how to fish, they'll spend a the day in a the boat drinking beer. But uh, that's just uh, 
probably a bad joke, but uh, again, we're, we're really, really all about trying to teach life skills and, and helping people to uh, find very meaningful careers. And we have been successful in doing that, as you'll see as, from the rest of this program. So uh, again, more reasons for launching the program. We have an aging workforce. Who doesn't? Uh, we have a ton of expected attrition. Uh, created a lot of hiring problems. Uh, one of my responsibilities is to make sure that the employees are well trained and even our contractors that they are qualified before they start to work on the pipeline. So you can see the reasons why we really needed to put this program together. The last, the, the last bullet on that previous slide, that before Esther and I launched the program, we spent a significant amount of time planning for its, uh, for its success. And one of the things that we did, and one of the things you want to keep in mind if you decide to roll out something similar, is we called a lot of the key business partners together before we launched the program. I remember it was actually October of 2013. We had the New Jersey State Department of Labor with us. We had several hiring contractors, contractors that perform pipeline work in a room to validate that they were actually going to need and hire the students that graduated from this program. And I think that is an important step that you should not overlook if you decide to embark on something similar. Esther? Right. So hello, everyone. This is Esther Gendika. Uh, we all know that it is policy that drives what decisions in education are going to be. And of course, now everybody should know about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, that basically it is an updated way of doing jobs training. And it's really a very strategic approach to talent development. So basically it says that if an individual must get a job, it, that person must have the skills to obtain that job. Therefore, education is extremely important to drive employment, and at the same time, it is that particular job that's driven by the training and any other support that's going to be provided that is going to make a person successful. Uh, the most important element in this partnership that Atlantic Cape Community College and South Jersey Gas have is this employer partnership that we were able to build with South Jersey Gas. This particular program, as Tony Pizzullo and I have been talking, this program really fulfills the needs of WIOA because it provides a career pathway the people who graduate the program that we are going to outline in a few minutes are able to start in an entry-level position and then very quickly be able to increase their skills through different credentials that each company will provide in order to be successful and go into a career pathway. Three elements of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act our employer partnerships, this idea of a career pathway, and most important is a, a valued credential. And Northeast Gas provides the credential that everyone in the natural gas industry will certainly identify with and consider extremely important. As you, he, as you see here, nothing is done in a vacuum and there have to be a lot of business partners in order to be successful. Atlantic Cape, Gloucester County, Cumberland County, Camden County, um, without a doubt the local one stop, Atlantic Cape, has a wonderful relationship with the one stop. They are the ones that are funding this program. And the reason why they are indeed funding it is the fact that the people, when they graduate, they get jobs. And as you see, the entity that provides the curriculum and the training, the, the, the importance in the technical training is Northeast Gas Association that does rigorous uh, testing and provides the OQs, the operator qualifications that are important for somebody to get a job in the gas industry. 
Tell yeah, me. we uh, one of the things that Esther and I looked at, particularly myself, was the very limited internal resources that I had available uh, to me. Uh, and but yet, with that said, we knew we needed to uh, to leverage and acquire certain expertise. So, as Esther explained, the Northeast Gas Association had great had a great operator qualification examination program. So we utilized them to help us. So each one of our business partners listed here, and we don't list all of them, but they each played a very important role and uh, is a, it's a very key factor. If you're blessed with a, a large technical training staff uh, and, and if you're fortunate enough not to need any additional trainers, well, then maybe you wouldn't need to have so many partners. But I had a very limited uh, internal resource pool available, and uh, by leveraging the partnerships, it really enhanced our... Uh, our success. The next, uh, next, next slide here. Uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about the requirements of of the applicants. Uh, what we looked for before we allowed someone to become an actual student in the program. Uh, and what the college did was really an outstanding job in first advertising the program. In the beginning, we had TV ads, radio spots. Not TV ads. We had radio spots, uh, newspaper ads, and uh, our web, our company website, the college website as well, advertised the program. I remember uh, going to the first open house. We we probably had 100 and over 125 people that wanted to become uh, students, and we only were going to accept 15 as a max for the first class. So I had learned from previous you know, lessons in the industry that. Um, First, first off, the jobs that we're hiring for are not simple jobs. They're very complex jobs. They're very difficult tasks that have to be performed. And the public safety is at, uh, is at risk here. So we had to make sure that we acquired uh, students that could graduate and actually perform the work, uh, the test, successfully. So we decided upon math and reading skills at the ninth grade level. We may have raised that to tenth grade level, I think, as we progressed. There's mechanical aptitude tests that were administered. and and physical requirements that were uh, we reviewed in detail with the applicants uh, so to make sure that they would understand what's required of them. Um, Esther, did I miss anything on that slide? And what we really did is we put together an info session, as Tony was saying the first time, I think radio spots was the best way to recruit uh, potential students. At the info session, we explained what the program was about. And at that same time, we tried to bring together the partners, these employer partners I was discussing that is so important. They actually uh, natural gas industry vendors to South Jersey Gas were present at that info session because they were able to explain the type of jobs in addition to South Jersey gas that the participants upon graduation would be able to obtain jobs in. So it became very realistic. They got a job, they got a, an opportunity to meet with the various vendors and likewise the vendors were able to see some of these uh, potential students and that was all before they actually decided that they wanted this uh, opportunity or even that they were going to be successful because of course it is the tape test and the Bennett mechanical that was needed. So funding, as I was saying before, uh, Atlantic Cape is extremely lucky to have the full support of the local one stop. Uh, funding is available through them and what we've done now to streamline, we have a contract with them where they will contract with us for a period of a year for a number of potential students. Uh, what we do at the info session, once a person decides that this will be a good venue for them, they have to sign up for the tape test. If they are successful with the scores that we expect, 
then they then come to us and we sign them up for the Bennett Mechanical. Once we know who the folks that are that are going to potentially be candidates in this program, we invite the one stop to come to us. They actually come to our school. They meet with the folks that have been successful and they go through an eligibility process where they gather the paperwork that is needed and if eligible, then the one stop is going to fund them. There is opportunities through GI bills, the veteran benefits, and of course there is always a private loan opportunity as well. The, the outline of this program, we heard what it is that the employers wanted us to make sure in addition to the technical schools that the folks would get. And absolutely at the top of the list always was this idea of soft, of soft skills. So the college was doing communications, customer service, team building, these important elements that every student must be able to have before they even think about the technical piece. In addition to that, they came to class, they created, they got an overview of Word, they created a resume writing because at the very last day of the program when they were doing a job fair, they were all going to an interview with a ready-made uh, resume. And this idea of job preparation and work readiness, these folks are unemployed that are trying to get a different career path most of the time and this idea of work readiness is extremely important. We felt and all the vendors and all the employers that worked with us felt that the, uh, the essence of uh, communications, the importance of team building and customer service was extremely important and we made sure that it was part of the program and we started the, cro the program with those elements and modules. The college did a great job at teaching those soft skills especially uh, because we realize how important it is for people to work safely. They have to be able to work as a team, team member and to be able to adequately communicate with each other. So uh, that was why we selected those soft skills. Uh, South Jersey Gas Company took upon uh, uh, the responsibility of making sure the technical training was what it needed to be. Uh, in concert with the Northeast Gas Association, we provided uh, some classroom lecture and a couple weeks of really hands-on uh, training out in our training field. We did some uh, uh, simulation exercises and then the students were actually tested with uh, the OQ test. Uh, for each task that they were going to perform. So uh, we're a heavily regulated industry. The Department of Transportation requires uh, what we call operator qualification uh, tests and exams that they be passed before someone performs certain tasks. So those tests were administered and uh, obviously make the candidates and graduates uh, very uh, marketable once they pass those exams. And they ensure us as employers that uh, people know what you're doing before you're given any assignments. If I wanted to emphasize one thing here on this slide the most, it's that the curriculum that we put together here is completely customizable. It's we're, really what we're looking to do today is share the model and then you can customize that model, customize the program to fit your particular situation. I will say that no good deed goes unpunished and because most of us realize that uh, we, we not only had contracts in place with our key business partners uh, before we launched, but we also required the participants to sign a release. It's just a reality. Um, no one was guaranteed a job and uh, that was uh, the gist of the release. So. So typically, we have two programs. As Tony was saying, these programs are totally customizable. The first program that we offered was the gas operations technician program. It was always 124 hours, but one of the South Jersey vendors is a utility line locate vendor, and 
that particular company had a precise reason why they wanted their employees to have particular skills. So as a byproduct of gas operations technician, the utility line locate technician program was created. So as you think about this program and you think of the needs that you have in your particular areas, think who the employers are and how it is that you can customize this program to address those particular needs. And NGA, Northeast Gas Association, has the curriculum that would really complement all those skills. We started with a 124-hour program, and that contained the soft skills we were discussing. And of course, what the people mostly want is the hands-on instruction. It's rigorous curriculum. It's a lot of information. They get a binder that is, I don't know, Tony, maybe three inches big, right. four inches big. It's Get huge. There is tremendous amount of work to be done. But then it is done with a lot of help and mentorship and hands-on instruction, and they are all successful. And the same with the utility line locate technician. It's really customizable to that particular need, and it is shorter. It's usually just about 10 days, 7 hours a day. And the idea is to provide them with the skills for an entry-level position for that particular industry and company. Thanks, Esther. And there's no particular magic to why we um, decided to train for these particular types of programs. It's simply because this is where we had the greatest uh, employment needs. We needed operations technicians and we needed utility line locators. So that was uh, that's the reason why we focused on those programs. It's really the jobs that will drive the education that we provide, basically, and that's what WIOA says today. This is, uh, this is important because it is the commitment that we make to our students on day one, and the same commitment at the end. We hold a job fair for open positions. It happens at the very beginning and it certainly happens at the very end and of course uh, in order to get a job you must have obtained those credentials that are important to the industry in order to be hired. We put that program together because there were no folks that were actually trained in order to get these entry-level positions and through this program we are able to do so. I think we can skip on to the next slide as we already talked about the importance of the operator qualification credentials. Here with this slide, uh, we show you a picture, couple of pictures of our first job fair. You can see most of us were just full of smiles. Uh, it was a great opportunity to, to showcase the graduates, the students that were looking for jobs. And here you see some of them being interviewed. And in this first class, I believe that they were all placed. There might have been one student who decided to pursue a different career only because there was an incident that uh, we uh, we showcased uh, during the uh, training program. It happened to occur in North Jersey. We explained to the students, uh, the incident explained and showed uh, some of the dangers of working in our business, and a particular uh, individual decided to go elsewhere. But the remaining 14 students, I believe, all were placed in, in very nice uh, employment positions. So uh, what we talked about at the job fair and, and what the, really the hiring folks and companies talked about, and we were amongst the hiring companies, South Jersey Gas hired a few of the graduates, uh, but the starting rates would all vary by company. Nobody was guaranteed a job, but they were all guaranteed an interview and that they would be given a chance to be placed uh, They were into a number of different positions. So that was more to answer some of the students' questions. Um, because of our regulations, we did explain the requirements of, of the Federal Drug and Alcohol Testing Program and some of the other, um, you know, physical uh, weather type of extremes that they would experience on the job. So we wanted to make sure there'd be no surprises that people knew what they were getting into. So the next slide talks about our implementation issues. Uh, planning is the key way to address those concerns. Uh, sure, you might not be perfect 
perfect in your planning. You, you may forget occasionally some of the issues, but having a plan certainly increases the likelihood of success. And the big issue for me was the, the resource constraints, and we were able to manage that by partnering with people like Atlantic Cape Community College to help us get through this. So. And of course, there is funding for students, and uh, a, a very good element as well is once a student is placed into a position, there is opportunity for wage reimbursement as well. Right, and there was a TAC grant that uh, provided uh, a level of assistance, particularly in, in purchasing some equipment that was needed to train the students. So that was a, a, a great, a great value to really for the students. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is really the model uh, in a simplified fashion that we have committed ourselves to sharing wherever we can and whenever we can and today is just one of those opportunities. Uh, encourage you to determine what your business need is, to create the partnerships that you might need to uh, be able to launch a program. Make sure you communicate it well not only to people like students and applicants but also to prospective employers if, if you have contractors like we do. Have a great vetting process, a, a testing process to, in order to select participants to ensure that you have the right people in your program. And uh, you can see the rest of the model. Uh, uh, Jennifer Cleary from Rutgers Heldrich Center was extremely helpful in helping us, helping us to, uh, to help assess the program when we first launched it and give us some ideas for improvement opportunities. So where are we today? We are very happy to actually report that about 60 students have graduated and even happier to actually say that about 95% of those who successfully completed have indeed gotten employment. And they are not only entry-level employment but on a career path to do bigger and better things. Um, the two South Jersey contractors, as we said, that uh, are trying to do programs specific to their needs are two vendors that work with South Jersey Gas. We just now, the end of October, finished a gas technician program and uh, we will do the same in 2016 and we will offer two additional classes of the Line Locate uh, program in uh, the spring of 2016 as well. That concludes our presentation and we'd welcome any questions if you have, uh, if you have some. Well, well, this is Carol. That was really an excellent presentation. Um, sounds like you've got a very dynamic program there with, with just wonderful outcomes. Um, we do have a couple questions that have come in, and I've been saving them for the end of your presentation. And before we get to those, um, I am going to ask that we launch our poll about implementation issues, because I've done workforce development for myself. And I know that some of these implementation issues you mentioned can make the difference between making and breaking a program. So I'm curious to find out from our attendees um, how they feel about the most important ones of these. I know sometimes uh, where I've been is really uh, having a hard time finding qualified instructors. Of course, we're in Vermont. We're a little smaller state, so I'm just wondering about those. Meanwhile, um, while people are thinking about that, um, let me look at these questions. I have one that came in about the training. And it says um, that there's 124 hours of training, but the person was wondering how many days a week or how many weeks does that break down to? And what percentage of those 124 hours and the 70 hours are soft skills? So I, would, I would say uh, it's approximately three to four week programs. Probably 75% of it is, or 70% of it is technical. I would also say please don't focus on our program or, or on that answer because what has to work is, is if it needs to be in reverse for you, it needs to be in reverse for you. You need to make it work. We're constantly uh, molding this program. We, we literally added a few topics to this last class to, to make the students even more marketable and to give them a few extra uh, qualifications. So Tony, that 124 hours, was that um uh, it's, how, how many, or Esther, how many weeks was that? It's, uh, it's usually Monday through Thursday or Monday through Friday, depending, and it's 9 a.m. to about 3.30 p.m. So it's very intense every day for three and a half weeks or so. Okay, good. 
great. Thank you. And then we have another question. Go ahead, Tony. No, we had students, you know, come in early, stay late, and we're always willing to help them out. But the key is don't focus on our program because right. you need to design something that's going to be effective uh, for your situation. Great. So another question we have is what is the completion rate of participants? Uh, I can't remember anybody dropping out. Yeah, did there I, was did only I, one person this past class that had really personal issues, and that's why he was not able to complete. But okay. otherwise, 100%. Wow. Yeah, you, you did it. Okay. And um, how many business partners or employers are participating? You cut out. Are we still connected? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How many employers or business partners are, are participating? We have uh, several contractors working for South Jersey Gas, JF Kiley, Crown Construction, Precision Pipeline Solutions, uh, UtiliQuest, um, several others. So there were probably at least uh, seven, least, eight. Yeah, eight contractors plus South Jersey Gas Company and then the other business partners. Uh, we were able to, to run a few programs with the other community colleges in our territory, and we've uh, just kind of partnered mostly with. Atlantic Cape at this point because of the economic situation in Atlantic County and Cape May counties and, and the desire to uh, that we just work so well with each other to, to keep it going this way. Okay, great. And then uh, another question asking, do you focus any of your recruitment effort with the one-stop centers in targeted groups such as veterans or women to diversify the workforce? Uh, yes, uh, the One Stop is always very receptive to veteran needs. Um, unfortunately, women, although they would like to be part of the program, sometimes the requirements of the job are not really conducive. Uh, they have to be able to lift 100 pounds, and that usually is the one element that uh, gets uh, a female probably out of the equation. Uh, we have not had, Tony help me out if I'm saying something that's not true, but I do not believe we've had a female graduate this program yet, have we? What's really interesting, uh, no, but one of the, the county colleges was communicating a woman in this, you know, a, a program especially geared towards women in this, in this energy career, energy industry. I attended that program with the particular intent of not only supporting the college's program, with advertising our operations technician program. Well, to make a long story short, I wound up hiring uh, uh, Shakira, who's one of those participants, uh, attendees, and she actually is now a trainer here at South Jersey Gas Company. And uh, so, you know, we've, we've even uh, presented at the NAACP uh, to their constituents, and we've, we've had uh, a well-diversified group of students and applicants. I mean, we advertise across the board and uh, the the standard to gain entrance into the program always stays the same so if you meet the standard you got a real good chance of, of uh, you know making it into the program we've had some repeat customers they did not have originally the required tape test so they've gone through some adult basic education classes they brought up the tape test and then they were part of this program so yes success stories all around yeah and i hired and another graduate from one of the first classes went to work for one of our contractors and about uh about a year later i hired him as a technical trainer so um, yeah. okay and then one last, one last question we had is, does either Atlantic Cape or South Jersey Gas do any marketing the program down at the high schools or um, the career technical education programs around the state? There was some interest by the Cumberland County Votech School. They actually came in and we talked to them. And I, I think going forward, they're partnering with Cumberland County College. It probably will be a more powerful partnership there in the future. Yeah. Esther, I'm not sure if you had anything else to add. No, um, but certainly the technical schools is uh, a venue where really we should be doing probably a little more marketing than we're doing right now. Yeah, that's often the place to really start that. Yeah. That path yeah. Right, right. Right. All With right. Cumberland County Votech, we explained the, the program and the requirements, and they, they're, I believe, starting to build up their uh, capabilities to teach so that the 
so that people could get into our industry a little bit easier. Excellent. Well, great. Well, thank you both so much. I'm going to move us along now, um, and I see we have the results of our poll. So I see that for most, uh, for a lot of people, 60% finding that education or business partner is key. So I hope that this webinar today is going to give you some ideas and some of our other material on how to do that, because I agree that is that is a critical, critical implementation issue. And I see my qualified instructors one is right up there at 40%. So they're all important and necessary to have good programs. So I'd like to transition us now to our next presenter, who is Kip Snow. So while Kip, uh, while we take the poll away, and while Kip is getting ready to share his screen with you, let me tell you a little bit about Kip. So Kip is at Anne Arundel Community College in Maryland, where he is an instructional specialist. He's responsible for providing high-quality instruction and program administration for the Transportation, Logistics, and Cargo Security Initiative including responsibility for everything course related. So course administration, faculty recruitment, scheduling, instruction, and curriculum development, all that as needed. He plays a major role in advising and recruiting students. And prior to his work in higher education, he was employed in industry. He worked as an operational specialist at Roden Schwartz. Uh, Kip holds an MBA and also a graduate certificate in leadership and management. So, we are now ready for um, Kip's slides. I have him accept the screen request. And Kip, if you accept that screen sharing request, we will go right to you. All right. What do, um, I'm not getting the message. Hmm. You're not seeing it on your screen? No. Bear with us one second, everyone. Omid well, can get ready to put your slides up if necessary. I'll hang on. And I appreciated the questions from people. Um, it's nice to know there's uh, folks who are, are uh, listening and finding some uh, good information here. And also the responses to the poll. I appreciate that. Well, we're getting ready to show these slides. Bear with us a minute. Here we are. There's Kip's presentation. All right, Kip. It's all yours. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so the, the, uh, the program that I have here is a little bit different than what you uh, just recently saw, but I want to explain a little bit about who we are and what we do and, and our connection with industry and um, how it relates to a lot of the academic and career pathways that are discussed. Um, a little bit about our program here at uh, Anne Arundel Community College. We have two credit certificates. Uh, they're both 18, uh, uh, 18 credits. Uh, one focuses uh, primarily on, on transportation management and the other is more supply chain management. So we try to do two very distinct uh, uh, programs, uh, two, two distinct areas within the transportation industry. Uh, and the goal with these two certificates is to provide an industry-focused training for entry to mid-level employment. So what we have found in our particular uh, market is that uh, and there are a number of jobs that, that are entry-level positions that require either a high school diploma or some college. So this is a program that uh, not only provides industry basic training, but it also provides that some college requirement that a lot of the entry-level positions are looking for. Uh, the, the courses uh, are core courses based on industry uh, specific areas. Um, we have courses, uh, one of our courses is an introduction to transportation and logistics that focuses on the five modes of transportation as it relates to, to freight management. Uh, we have an, an airport and seaport operations course, so we talk about what happens at, at the air side and land side operations for an airport. And then the seaport is cargo movement through a, a particular uh, a port of entry. Now, we have a supply chain management course, and then we also have a, a domestic and international freight operations course that takes the five modes of transportation and goes into pricing and costing and decision-making processes as it relates to freight movement. Our program started in uh, 2008. We applied for a, a, 
a Department of Labor Workforce Development grant at, um, after some uh, encouragement from BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport, um, and uh, to because at that particular time they the airport and the transportation industry was looking at uh, the baby boomer generation retiring uh, and trying to fill the the um, employment gap that was expected. Uh, we at, we went to the Port of Baltimore and had a number of um, entities there, both private and public, to help us uh, with, and, and they came on board as a business partner to support the curriculum development and advising from the industry perspective. So the program was developed uh, with industry in mind and based on what industry needed. Uh, some of the we have two other major uh, partnerships right now uh, that uh, as we have grown since 2008. One is with our uh, our, our local county school system. Uh, there is a high school that's in the the northern part of Anne Arundel County. It's a North County High School. They have what's called a signature program, and it's a program that's designed around uh, a, a, uh, the community. Um, uh, in the community cultural area. It just so happens that they're they're very close to uh, the tourism area and transportation around BWI Airport. And what they've created is a is this program where students go from their ninth grade to their twelfth grade year and follow an academic pathway that supports entry level uh, um, positions right out of high school. This particular program and this in the students' ninth grade and tenth grade year. They follow high school, uh, uh, high school based transportation programs and their general education courses that have transportation overlays built into it. For instance, um, you know, in, in, in reading class or English class, if they're reading a novel, instead of just reading a, a general novel, they would maybe uh, follow Moby Dick and, and tie some of the maritime related aspects of, of, the, of the book as it relates to transportation. Uh, in the students' uh, junior and senior year, we actually have created a dual credit program where the students take college courses in the high school environment, and so instructors, professors from the from the community college go out to the high school each day and teach the college courses on the high school campus. And this uh, this allows the student to complete one of our 18 credit certificates in the high school. They earn, they earn the, the high school credit as well as the college credit as approved by the State Department of Education. And the students actually will graduate with their college certificate about a week before they graduate high school, so which is pretty exciting. Uh, this is in a particular demographic where there's a higher percentage of students once they finish high school or graduate high school, they will go and find a job that may quite often just be a minimum wage job and they don't really seek the college, um, the, the, the college opportunities that are out there. This gives them an opportunity to start at a at a at a dollar wage position that's a higher than minimum wage and in an industry that's lucrative and and self-sustaining. So it's a pretty exciting program. Right now, I have um, eleven seniors who are in their last part of their program and I expect uh, you know either 10 to 11 of those to graduate this year as the first cohort that's gone through the four-year program. Um, and each year I have a, a large pipeline of students that are coming into that program to take advantage of that. We also have a partnership with the Southeast Maritime and Transportation Center. It's a National Science Foundation Advanced Technology uh, Center. They focus on the maritime and transportation industry and they're based in Norfolk, Virginia uh, and work um, in conjunction with Tidewater Community College. Their focus is to look at the maritime and transportation industry's four sectors of shipbuilding and ship repair, the marine uh, sector, the seagoing industry, and then the port logistics industry. And with our connection with the Port of Baltimore and intermodal transportation. We have become a very good and close partner with the Southeast Maritime and Transportation Center SMART uh, to provide uh, professional development and uh, focus on curriculum development within this particular area. So they, they assist us with funding to support these initiatives. Each summer uh, we host a 
a smart institute where we have 25 teachers. They are um, uh, secondary uh, secondary educators, career counselors, guidance uh, coaches, um, uh, college professors, and we give them a week-long immersion in the transportation industry at, here in the Port of Baltimore. They experience uh, guest speakers, uh, panelists. We take them on field trips in and around port uh, locations. Uh, they're they're asked to 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 be prepared to do walking and climbing, and be in some confined spaces in some in some places to be able to experience what some of these workers are experiencing in their day to day jobs. And the goal here is for the the teachers to go back into their classrooms and adapt their curriculum to support the uh, the education centered around the transportation industry in hopes that these students will go and um, uh, look at academic and career pathways that exist for them to get jobs in the industry. So this has been a very uh, um, a good partnership. Uh, a little bit more about our program. We, uh, the, the, the program supports incumbent workers and we find that there are a lot of of um, incumbent workers who did start out in the industry with right out of high school and they're looking to advance their career what since since they've been in the career for career field for a long period of time uh, so they are coming back to try to get some type of college credential uh, we also see a good number of displaced workers who understand that the transportation industry is growing so this is a great opportunity to get some retraining or retooling to be able to enter the industry and then our other target is traditional students, the the 18 year old out of high school who doesn't know what they want to do, and that this may be an opportunity for them to have a a, a, a decent career. Uh, our program we also focus on identifying academic and career pathways, so that the student knows what they have to do in order to um, academically master each level if they want to go into an associate's. Uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree pathway, or at each point of, of, of a degree, what jobs exist for them to jump off of that academic ladder into a career ladder and, and kind of ping pong back and forth between that. Um, but we've had a lot of success in, in, in support with industry-related partnerships. And we have a number of companies that work with us in many different capacities, and, and some of them include offering internships. We, our certificate program uh, requires that a student particip participates in an internship. It's a course, and the student is required to work 90 hours over a 15-week semester in conjunction with a, a course where they learn the soft skills needed to work out in the industry. And the internship can be paid or unpaid, so the student has the ability to to, as a capstone course, go out and work and experience some of these uh, industry uh, um, um, foundations that, that they've learned about in the, in the classroom. Uh, we do have a curriculum advisory group that meets on a, on a semester basis to talk about what changes exist on, in the industry and what do we need to do in the classroom to support those changes. And we, we uh, greatly appreciate the feedback that we receive from industry to help support whatever is happening. Um, we, we have a number of uh, uh, business partners who, who use the program to recruit from for jobs or, or career opportunities and, and under, with the understanding that the, um, the, that the student has some basic knowledge about the transportation and logistics industry. And the feedback that we get from the employers is that having that learning curve reduced reduces the amount of cost associated with training or the initial on-the-job training, which is good for focusing on whatever their initial goals are for the employment. We also have the... The privilege to be able to take some field trips to some of these industry locations, so that the students can get firsthand knowledge of what we're talking about in the classroom. Uh, it, it's great to be able to walk around uh, FedEx's cargo bay and have our uh, em, em, employer, the, the manager there at the 
at the cargo bay to explain some of the technology aspects related to their operation and and, it's, and for me to be able to say, and this is what we talked about in class last week, and, and they actually get some uh, hands-on idea of what's actually happening. And we do have guest speakers who come in to talk about what they do on a daily basis, and, and some of our business partners are, um, give some scholarships to support the, um, uh, the, the students going to school. Uh, some of our key industry partners, uh, of course, the uh, uh, BWI Airport and Maryland Aviation Administration has been very supportive of our program. Uh, Ports, uh, Ports America Chesapeake, who is the operating um, connection for the, uh, the Port of Baltimore for Dundalk and Seagirt Marine Terminals. Um, they are very supportive of our program also. Ruckert Terminals, who is a private, uh, a private port, handles a lot of brake bulk services. They uh, have been uh, very key and instrumental in supporting the educational aspects. Uh, Southwest Airlines is a new uh, a business partner who's come on board here recently, and they're trying to do something new because they have a, uh, the meeting that I had last week is they have 250 open positions in the Baltimore market that they're trying to recruit for, and they can't find the the people that they need to, to meet those uh, to meet those positions. Um, between uh, FedEx and Priority Worldwide Services, the um, the freight forwarders, the customs brokers, the, these are the the other entities that we work closely with. Um, also, the Baltimore Metro Council they have a freight movement task force. It's a planning arm that supports freight movement within the, um, the, the Baltimore market, the, uh, the, the metro market. Uh, and we work with them a little bit from, from a planning perspective, showing students that there is a planning side to the transportation industry, and then they solicit for information for planning for future uh, transportation operations. Um, so those are some of the business partnerships that we have. We also have some industry association partnerships, so the, um, the Baltimore Port Alliance. So that's a conglomerate of all of the public and private port entities in, at the Port of Baltimore. They meet together on a regular basis. Quarterly, there is an education subcommittee meeting uh, where uh, both educators and industry come together to talk about how do we support educational initiatives within this area. Uh, a lot of people don't know that as you're going through the Baltimore Harbor over one of the bridges, what what do those big ships and cranes do out there? They, and so we're there to try to help promote some of those, uh, break down that lack of education barrier that exists. Um, the uh, Women's Traffic and Transportation Club is another group that supports us, and then the, the uh, once again, the, the Freight Movement Task Force. Uh, so these are all associations that work together, that we work closely with in order to promote uh, education. All right, so that's, uh, th that's the focus on our, um, on our partnerships and our programs, and I guess if there's any questions out there, I'll be glad to, to field those. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kip. And we do have a question or two coming in. Um, but before we get to those, I'd just like to um, put up a poll that I put together, seeing your slides and knowing workforce like I do about those resources um, that you need in your partnerships with employers. And so we're interested in knowing of um, you know these these five areas. What are the resources that educators need? Uh, what, when people who are building workforce programs, what do they feel they really need from employers? So interested to see what our educators and the audience are thinking about this. So one question that came in is about the um, program with uh, North County High School, that dual degree program, and it sounded, when I heard you describe it, really, really amazing that students could earn those 18 credits, but the question asked about how many students are enrolled in that, they actually earn the 18, and about how what group of those, how what number move into a program at your school. Uh, the, uh, the this is the, the first cohort, so this is a, a fairly new program. We've spent the past five to six years developing the program and moving the cohort from from their ninth grade year to their twelfth grade year. The first cohort is in our, our seniors this year, so I'm going to have my first graduates actually graduate this um, this uh, this spring coming up. I have uh, about ten graduates that will actually graduate, uh, and the 
in the junior class. I have about 17 students who are currently on the pathway through. Um, <clears throat> about about 10 or 11 are cohort students that have gone through the whole program all all the way through, and then I have about six or seven that are uh, have decided that you know through word of mouth or or other promotion that this is an industry that they want to get involved in and have come into the program about halfway. So I'll have about uh, next year I'll have about 10, another 10 or, or 11 that will graduate and then I'll have another uh, 6 to 7 that will uh, have completed some of the cert college certificate and they, they have the option of coming on to the community college the next year to, um, to finish the certificate and gain entry level employment if that's what they want. Now we have, have built into the program that, that academic ladder so all of the classes that um, that are part of this certificate are uh, part of our business management program and we've designed it so that the students when they take these <coughs> courses or these 18 credits that they all uh, apply to the business management associates of applied science degree. So the students have the ability to continue on at the community college if they so choose or they could take these 18 credits and have them transferred to the institution of their choosing um, and, and have that, those credits uh, transferred as, as uh, electives or, or if it's a school that has those same, that same program there, then the, they, can, they can have that uh, directly equate to those particular courses. I think that when, when I started working with this first cohort last year, most of them um, I, you know, had talked about going directly into the workforce or uh, one or two were looking at maybe a four-year institution and then some of them were looking at military options to uh, to go into after high school but uh, out of it this year and, and talking with them and explaining to them what academic pathways exist I know that I have four students that are planning on coming to the community college now to continue on with their their degree so that you know that's it's once students understand what opportunities exist, their goals change a little bit and what they choose to go into. And so we were able to pick up some some more enrollment because of what you know uh, because of these changes. Wow, that's terrific! What a program! I mean, that I I'm sure students re realize what an advantage that gives them and step up in either employment or going on to college, which is just such a win-win. So um, thank you so much, Kip. Uh, loved hearing about your program. And I see the results of our poll are up that we're looking at mainly internship placements followed up with curriculum advice or professional mentoring. And yeah, I mean, so many programs now are really building in those internships. And I know it's difficult to find those. And sometimes there's other issues in terms of workforce and workplace safety and so on. But it's certainly something that we need to keep focusing on as we build these partnerships. So thank you. If you'd like, I can address a little bit very quickly about those two those two points. Um, you know what I'm going to say is let's save that for the end. I'd like to move on to Ian to be sure we have enough time, okay. and then we'll come back. Okay, thank you, Kip. So um, we can take the poll away, and as we're starting to transition to Ann Harrison with the screen sharing while she's bringing that up, I will read. Um, Let's take a look at Anne's background and little bio here. And so Anne Harrison has served as the program manager for state and federally funded employment and training programs in Connecticut. Previously, she was a policy and research manager on workforce development issues and began her career as a newspaper reporter working in public relations. She's currently the communications director for the Workforce Alliance and Workforce Investment Board for South Central Connecticut based in New Haven. And I see that Anne has got her slides up. And as I mentioned previously, these were done in collaboration with Kimberly Denham. So um, Anne, if you're ready, we're ready for you. Hi, I'm ready. Hi, everybody. And thanks for, for having me. And, on, um, behalf, and also thank you on behalf of Kim, Dun Kim Dunham, who um, helped put together this slide and, and has been a, a great partner here in New Haven um, and in South Central Connecticut. Um, and I'm calling this uh, transportation workforce dynamics um, for a couple of reasons. You can see the definition here, dynamics of the forces or properties that stimulate growth, development, or change within a system or a process. Um, because my experience in transportation workforce development has been one that has been continually challenging and that has 
always forced me to think of new approaches and partners. Uh, the big message here is that what seems cut and dry never is. <laughs> so I've enjoyed hearing everyone's success stories today, and hopefully you won't view this as a cautionary tale, but as more so of how things change over time and, and you know, ways that by bringing in new partners and kind of looking at things differently, you can um, change your programs to adapt and also serve uh, the people in your region. So what I'm going to be speaking about, um, as, as uh, Carol mentioned, I have kind of a joint perspective. Um, I have worked on the college side for Gateway Community College, which is based in New Haven, Connecticut. It's the largest of the 12 community colleges in Connecticut. Um, but also from the Workforce Investment Board side, and everyone knows that the colleges and the WIBs are very important partners um, in any region. So I'm going to tell the story starting with what got our region talking about transportation training uh, and kind of beyond um, CDL training, which is uh, where a lot of people um, only think of transportation. And um, that was actually a credit program at the community college in railroad engineering technology. Uh, that was really the jumping off point for South Central Connecticut. So I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about what is still happening in the sector today, and what are the lessons learned from this journey. So just a little bit of history, and when you get, uh, if you get a, a copy of the PDF um, of, of the presentation, it actually will link you to information at the colleges about the railroad engineering technology degree programs, and also the non-credit uh, program uh, division uh, program information. So the, the Gateway Railroad Engineering Technology is an associate degree program. So it's a two-year program that began um, a number of years ago with input from Metro North Railroad, which is the commuter rail um, that's based out of New York City that provides commuter rail service um, for New York, New Jersey, and, um, and Connecticut, parts of New Jersey and, and Connecticut. It had anticipated expansion and a large number of retirements in the new millennia and was planning ahead. The program, uh, the associate degree program, was designed with Metro North input, um, but both the electromechanical and the signaling and communications uh, tracks, for pardon the pun, um, were provided training that could lead to jobs at other railroads and has, including Amtrak, Long Island Railroad, and subway transit systems basically any electrical-based operation. Freight rail was not as applicable, but the general curriculum includes history of the railroad, uh, current rules, regulations, standards, and practices, and an overview of occupations in the industry. Those who complete the two-year program with a certain GPA um, are then exempt from having to take a very challenging application exam that Metro North requires of all of its applicants. So based on what you're applying for, there is an application exam, which is the first step for everybody um, who applies to any positions. Um, and you need to pass that before you can get any work, um, move along in the application process. So those who complete the credit program with the right GPA are exempt from having to take that exam. And the college works closely with the, with Metro North to track graduates through the application process. Um, in this case, completing the degree was considered enough to be job ready in the eyes of Metro North because the curriculum was comprehensive enough. Um, you kind of got a soup to nuts overview of what they expected someone to know coming in, so they weren't looking for a previous, um, any previous experience. Um, the associate degree has been around for a number of years. I don't have the exact um, year that it began, um, but at any point has close to 100 students enrolled in, in one or more of its classes. Some students at the college take history of the railroad, for an example, even if they're not pursuing the railroad engineering technology degree, but they take it as a humanities elective. So that's sort of interesting. Um, and uh, to give you an idea of the size of the typical um, size of the program, in this past May in 2015, the college graduated 16 um, with associate degree pro programs. And that is, uh, that is either for the signaling and communications track or the electromechanical track. 
um, and I should and I should say that both the credit that the credit program and the non-credit program, which I'm going to talk about next, uh, includes instructors from Metro North and also other other sources. So, based on the success of the credit program in 2010, Metro North suggested that there would be a kind of a spin-off, um, a more accelerated program, the so one that wouldn't take two years. Um, that would be solely focused on preparing candidates for one particular occupation, and that was, uh, in particular, that occupation exam, and that was the maintenance of electrical or the M of E position, because Metro North saw a particular need for a deeper talent pool there. And because it was a non-credit program and could be completed in six months or less, the Workforce Investment Board, Workforce Alliance, was able to support the program by paying for an initial cohort. Um, so this is where I came into the picture. <laughs> um, at the time, I was a fairly new program coordinator at the WIB, and my focus was actually green jobs, um, which meant that I could authorize training for unemployed, underemployed, or incumbent workers through um, an ERA grant, um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, a, fund, a training and employment program called the State Energy Sector Partnership. So you can hear from the name, that at the time, green jobs were really mostly thought of taking place in renewable energy or in energy efficiency. Um, and we all remember that there were thought to be, you know, we thought there were going to be thousands of weatherization jobs, thousands of solar panel installer jobs, energy consultant jobs, and the like. Um, but green also, um, what I, what I uh, through some research and some input, green also encompassed mass transit jobs. Um, so because it encourages less fossil fuel consumption and also less personal vehicle use. So when I saw that Gateway was doing this program and I could help fund it, I jumped at the chance. Um, but just like the green jobs movement did not create the expected number of new and emerging jobs in general, the non-credit accelerated program did not lead to the anticipated number of graduates actually going to work for Metro North Railroad. And the reason is the same. Uh, the reason is transferable skills. Um, green jobs mostly were a matter of enhanced skills for blue and white collar workers. So folks who already had experience and background had to learn the new green economy and some new green vocabulary, earn some new certifications. Everyone remembers LEED. Everyone knows about NABCEP. Um, and some school workers came off the bench and did find work thanks to incentive-based programs that spurred on products and services related to renewable energy and energy efficiency. But very few found sustainable new green jobs. And what was similar about the first cohort of the non-credit program was that only those who had transferable skills and some related electrical or mechanical experience prior to the training actually got jobs. Uh, the training was focused on preparing to pass a very difficult application exam, and many actually did pass that exam. Um, there were screenings in place coming into the trainings um, at the WIB level, because um, that's where all the recruitment was done initially, um, to have math and reading thresholds based on CASAS testing, and also folks had to be WIA eligible at the time, so they had to be a certified dislocated worker or a uh, low-income adult. Um, however, Metro North did not see, in this case, passing the, um, passing, taking the class and passing the exam as a ticket to a job. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, in hindsight, you know, from the perspective of where the college and the WIB were uh, through all this, it, uh, we really assumed too much. We assumed there would be too much weight put on the fact that this program had been done at their request that these folks had prepared for and passed their entry exam. Um, and we didn't ask the right questions initially up front. And we instead just focused on recruiting people and the college focused on um, building this program in a short amount of time. Um, because Metro North still required folks to enter the pool with everyone else who had passed the exam. And it was up to them to have the right resume. And if they had made it past that, they needed the right interview skills. And if they needed past that, um, they had to still go through a criminal history check and still uh, pass a medical physical profile. And uh, to the credits, to the college's credit, um, they did do a lot with mock interviewing skills with students and kind of preparing them for that. 
Um, so the WIB and the college mistakenly thought that the exam was the end game when it was really just the first hurdle. And because of that, the program had to adapt. Um, Interesting, in the meantime, when all this was happening, and you know, around the 2010-2011 time frame, the college itself had in the meantime applied for a competitive grant and won the grants based on the expectations of the non-credit program being a success. Um, however, but by then, word had gone out in the community that the first and second cohorts had not had good job results. Um, recruitment was down and outcomes were poor. And, um, and that's when uh, the college asked me to come on board, actually, um, to, to go to work directly at the college um, to help work directly on, on, for lack of a better word, fixing the program and, and really figuring out how uh, the college could deliver a non-credit program that would actually lead to employment. Um, so my work entailed understanding how to truly create a pipeline to employment through the non-credit program. Um, the curriculum, it meant the curriculum, the length and the scope had to be tweaked um, and modified. We, we shrunk it down from six months to a much shorter program. And we also um, had to clearly define those transferable skills for applicants and screen for those skills. So that, at that point, meant introducing electrical and mechanical testing, which we used Keytrain to do. Um, we also screened people, initial applicants, through an online screening uh, form where we asked people you know, about hand tools experience, we asked about CDL driving experience and other things taken directly from uh, job descriptions um, um, for Metro North jobs and, and other jobs as well. Um, the other thing is that instead of partnering with the WIB as a sole source of candidates and funding, um, because the college had received a, a grant, those grant funds were used to subsidize instruction and materials. And that meant we could oper, open recruitment to a wider audience. Uh, the focus of the program actually also had to widen. We could not only focus on Metro North jobs and, cert, and not only focus on railroad jobs. And that's a little different from what some folks today have talked about, where they talked about a very specialized, very focused, very customized program. Um, but in our case, we needed to open more doors for people within the transportation workforce sphere and bring in more partners, um, and, and uh, given the restrictiveness of the original focus, which was just Metro North, just railroad jobs. Um, we had to give participants a view that there were so many other opportunities in the transportation sector, um, and, but with the right skills and certifications. So career exploration became a major focus of the non-credit program. The core electrical mechanical curriculum stayed the same, but instead of only finishing with a certificate of completion for the non-credit program, we also added an OSHA 30 credential. Um, so we actually brought in a trainer to came in and delivered that on campus. Um, that was a direct recommendation from the director of the state's registered apprenticeship office, who works with a wide spectrum of trades. Um, we also brought in a number of other TDL um, employers as guest speakers and also to make them aware of the applicant pipeline. So we had folks come in from trucking, logistics. Um, we had our automotive program folks come in, um, freight rail, regional planning, and local, local transit systems. Um, so the Greater New Haven Transit District uh, with Kim is one of those key became one of those key partners for us. And the transit district actually went a step further than sending a guest speaker to want to talk to one of our classes. The district actually hosted a visit to their facility, including a tour and a talk by their lead mechanic. Um, they met with the then executive director. We got to peek under the hoods and inside the vehicles that service uh, the disabled and elderly every day across greater New Haven. And the district has continued to be a partner um, and we'll talk a little bit about the district here. Um, so the Greater New Haven Transit District, just to give you a little background, services 10 towns in South Central Connecticut. And I just got these figures today, and it's amazing. They provided 238,500 trips um, in fiscal year 14-15, um, primarily um, providing integrated transportation services for the elderly and the disabled. Um, 
So that is that is kind of the bread and butter of what the transit district does. So this next slide actually shows some of the ways that the transit district worked with the non-credit program um, and supported it. So you can see uh, we brought them in during the final grant funded cohort. They provided guidance to us as we were tweaking that curriculum. And um, we talked about the tours. They continued to provide us with job descriptions and job postings. Um, and then af even af beyond that program was a, a collaborator with the city of New Haven as well as the college um, and also um, a local um, entity called New Haven Works which focuses strictly on New Haven residents. And we were partners in, in FTA, Ladders of Opportunity grant application. Um, we continue to work with the region to seek talented job applicants. Um, and actually, um, we can always count on the transit district to attend uh, graduation ceremonies <laughs> at the college. Um, I asked Kim to also share some of the issues facing uh, the transit district as an employer and you can see some of them here and probably none of these are surprising to any of the employers on the line but it's, it's good to have it directly from her. Um, the changing demographics increase the demand for elderly and handicapped transportation service uh, requiring an expansion of the current workforce. Uh, so as our, the population demands change the workforce has to change and adapt around that. Um, they're always considering talent retention and workforce development. And I mentioned Kim had been the deputy director when we worked together on this and has since, um, because of her retirement, assumed the role of executive director, which means backfilling other high-level management uh, and bringing on her own team um, at that level. So, we, you know, when we're talking about workforce development in the transportation industry, it's not always entry-level folks. It's often the higher-level folks and knowing, you know, what the needs and demands are um, in that in that industry, um, and you can see a couple of other here, which are not very uh, transportation sector specific. Um, everything from uh, covering staff out on family leave, labor relations, and, and having a sufficient candidate pool with uh, driver endorsements. Um, so, at this point, um, I'm back at the web, uh, but I can tell you that the the TDL sector has gained momentum in Connecticut as a focus sector. Um, and you can see some of the things that are happening here. There's a statewide working group right now on TDL workforce issues. Um, Metro North continues to talk about its anticipated uh, retirements and the need to keep that pipeline going. And, um, and uh, We'll talk a little bit about kind of where the non-credit program stands at this point. So the college has not run the non-credit program for adults since the last competitive grant ended, um, which did finish with an 85% placement rate um, in employment and training and non-training related. Um, and But what has changed is that uh, it is preparing and recruiting for a new cohort to train out-of-school youth. Um, with funding from the web as part of the WIOA um, funding for out-of-school youth. And I was part of the writing the proposal to the web to be an out-of-school youth training provider before I left the college to come back. And I can tell you that the focus, and the, I think this is an interesting point too when we're talking about uh, the community college in particular, is that the focus is on, is, first of all, it's not only on those railroad electromechanical jobs, as an end game, but it, but it is focused on entry level sector jobs that are appropriate for um, the out of school youth. And though it, it's on creating a pipeline into that associate degree program. So giving the out of school youth kind of a taste of the TDL sector, giving them some certification, giving them some work experience because there's an internship component there. But then, because they're at the college, kind of opening their eyes to what their next step might be on the education ladder, which for many may be that railroad associate degree program, or it may be our automotive, the college's automotive degree program, both of which are uh, the associate level. And that is a huge step for us. I don't know what it's like at other colleges, but having a successful pipeline within the college between credit and non-credit um, is a big step. Um, 
to have credit, non-credit be viewed as a feeder into credit programming, uh, particularly for youth, which is up to age 24, is a big step. Um, and the credit programs in railroad engineering and automotive continue to be two of the most popular programs at Gateway and really only are behind nursing and allied health in popularity. Um, I wouldn't be um, serving the WIB well if I didn't also mention that we look at transportation as a work opportunity but also um, as a workforce barrier and that would be lack of transportation. So just letting you know um, some of the other things that are going on and that as a WIB and also as colleges and employers everyone can work on together um, in your region is looking at you know things that kind of impede folks from getting to and from jobs that that are available and in Connecticut we're looking at reduced rights to work funding there used to be a half a million dollar appropriation for that every year that we would uh, use to provide bus passes for the first 30 days of work um, here in South Central that funding has gone away, so we're looking to uh, work around that. Continuing to identify what I call job sprawl, which is where the jobs and the matching candidates aren't really co-located. And in a state like Connecticut, it's very small, but sometimes getting even a small distance uh, can be challenging for people without their own transportation. Um, I'm going to give a, a site something here, too, that poor residents travel further for work um, and tend to have an average commute of 90 minutes. Um, so can, we are taking some steps here. Um, there is a 50-year plan underway right now called Transform CD, CT that I started to be involved with when I was at the college. It was actually one of the activities for the class, that last cohort, was we had Connecticut DOT come in and the students actually provide feedback on the plan and then actually went out into the college community and got feedback from the larger student body on transportation issues. Um, New Haven has a very transit-oriented uh, development focus, um, both locally and in the regional plan. Um, we're always looking to replicate uh, best practices for van service in and around towns and cities. Um, we're anticipating expanded rail, uh, commuter rail service uh, by 2017. That will be a railroad that will connect to New Haven, Hartford, and Springfield up in Massachusetts. Um, and we are looking to partner more with Connecticut Transit to look at gaps and mass bus, match bus lines to where the jobs are. Um, at a WIB level, we are also um, in 2016 forming a transportation task force um, that will make uh, transportation as a, a front and center workforce, workforce issue. At the college level, um, these are ways that the, college, the community college um, continues to act as a resource in and around the issue of transportation and the workforce. Um, so through a grant from the Alexion Company, um, which is a bioscience company that um, is new to uh, the New Haven region, uh, provided a grant directly to the college to subsidize bus passes for college students. So they can buy it at a reduced rate thanks to the Alexion grant. Um, and it will can, the college will continue to offer those credit and non-credit certificates and degrees which are listed here. Um, so that is it for my presentation and um, hopefully like I said it didn't uh, sound too discouraging but um, but definitely has been quite a ride here <laughs> in South Central Connecticut but you know we see we see us going forward and still being um, still having uh, TDL be a big part of, um, of opportunity here in, in South Central Connecticut. Wow. Well, thank you, Anne. It, you know, I always feel that you can learn so much more for something that needs to be dissected and changed. It doesn't work anticipated. Then if everything just went great. So uh, I mean, I have been involved with um, workforce uh, programs that are similar to this, and, and it's always a great learning experience. And it sounds like you're on a wonderful track for the future. I cannot believe that it's 3 o'clock. This has gone by so fast. <laughs> I hope everyone will bear with me just for a minute. Because we do have a question for you, Anne, and it's around mm -hmm. the criminal background uh, issue. And the person would like to know if you have ideas on how to deal with that, because especially in um, transportation, you know, that uh, having a felony or something or your driver's license is, is often quite an issue. And while you're answering that, um, I see the screens are changing around a little bit. If people are able to, they can answer our very last poll. 
and if not, I understand. But Anne, do you, do you have a quick answer on the criminal background issue? Well, sure. The one thing that, again, we learned as we were going is that a driver's license is absolutely essential. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's a go-no-go no go issue in this industry. Even if you're not going to be driving as a primary part of your job, um, all of the feedback that we got from the employers were that you, you have to have that driver's license. Um, and in the case of the, the railroad employers, you can't even apply for a job without it. It's part of, it's part of, of that. Um, and that is because they uh, may expect you as maybe a kind of additional duties to be able to be able to move vehicles around, say. Sure. Um, and so, so that became, came to light for us. In terms of felonies um, and of and misdemeanors, you know, um, what we found with the employers we work for is there wasn't a hard and fast thing or kind of charge that um, just having the felony wouldn't in and of itself preclude anyone as a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, they always told us that the when did the offense take place and what was it. Um, were more of a factor depending on the on the job they were going for, you know. So if you were dealing, if you were going for a conductor job where you might be making, you know, a conductor on the rail means the people who take the people's tickets and punch their tickets um, right. at, for the riders. If you're going to be doing that, then you know you're handling money and you're handling uh, working directly with customers. So someone right. who might have had charges related to money issues or, or theft wouldn't be good candidates for that. Um, you know, so that's just an example of how a particular view is taken based on, you know, based on um, the job that they're going for. And that might not have mattered if someone was going to be an, elect an electrician, you know, right. or, you know, so it, they always told us that it, it was kind of a case by case which makes it hard to recruit. <laughs> um, it makes it hard to, you know, um, to really get that that specific candidate pool. But yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again. And so I have a few con concluding comments. And first of all, I want to say thank you to our presenters, to Tony Pozzuolo and Esther Gandica, to Kip Snow, and of course Ann Harrison. Really appreciate your input today. And also thank you to the attendees. Um, I do would like, uh, would like people to invite you to visit our website at netwc.net. Uh, we had a handout today from Jobs for the Future about our, um, let, let me put that slide up, about uh, community college and employer engagement. I think it would be valuable for everybody to read through that. It's not transportation specific, but still very important. Um, also look for the next webinar. It will be January 20th, sponsored by the Southwest Center with a focus on partnerships between employers and high school and CTE programs. And um, we will also have a series from the Northeast in the spring, um, late winter, again focusing on community colleges and building those strong pathways into the Transportation Center. So one last reminder, do take the survey before you leave. It really will help us. If you have any questions or issues, um, just get in touch via our website or email. And again, thank you so very much for being part of our program. Have a great afternoon.